Landry.audio, listen, like, and subscribe. Uh, after you hit the subscribe button, hit the little bell icon that sits beside it, which will allow you to receive all the notifications of our content on an ongoing basis. Today, I'm speaking with my friend, Noel Hadjimichael. Uh, Noel is an Australian who has moved to London, uh, UK. He's been living out there for the last few years, working as a consultant in the defense and security space. Um, he now calls uh, London home and he chairs an active ideas discussion initiative at the National Liberal Club in London that draws speakers and participants from across the political spectrum from Greens to Tories, if you can believe that. Uh, he recently has started an engagement with the Public Diplomacy Division of NATO, dealing with the tough issues of fake news, disinformation and hostile state activities and actions that undermine democracy and collective security. We are here to talk about China today and understand why so many people believe that they are such a significant threat to the Western world. Uh, I'm in the great city of Newcastle, Australia, and as I said, Noel is staying up late from his home in London to talk to us tonight. How are you? Hi, Jesse. Great to be invited. And yes, it is cold and dark in London. Well, as always, for... 10 and a half, this 11 year. months of the year, approximately. Okay. Um, so as I said, we, we're here to talk to you today about China. Now, I, I just, as I mentioned to you beforehand, what we're trying to do is kind of open up this conversation. A lot of people who might walk into this go, you know, I, I've heard about this. I don't fully understand this. So we want to talk a little bit about the origins and how we've gotten to this space. So um, I think as sort of a base level of knowledge, a lot of people know that uh, China is a communist country. But they don't really understand the scope of what is now happening and what we're dealing with at the moment. So I was thinking what we could do is we could just talk about how China kind of became a communist nation, how a lot of people have forgotten about the Cold War with the USSR and how it seems as though China has moved into that space. And then we can open it up from there. Does that sound good to you? Absolutely fine. And uh, I think it's no longer a luxury. I think it's essential that we understand the way things are. Um, what? Sorry, go ahead. Let's start there then. Uh, how, how does how does the modern China come to be? Well, the China that we know is very much the creature um, of the the incredible impact of the Second World War. Um, in the nineteen twenties, the Communist Party was created, just like communist parties were created around the world after the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, it, no surprise that China had millions of people living in poverty. Um, there were intellectuals who wanted to see socialism, communism created. Um, and there were, you know, real um, hardships and adversities um, that made life in China um, a real struggle. Um, China became a communist state, a mainland China, I should say, a communist state in 1949, after a very long civil war that happened before, during, and after the war against Japan in the Second World War. Um, so China's a, a one-party, top-down, uh, collectivist society. Um, there's a few million people who control maybe another 90 million party members. Uh, and more than a billion people on earth live in a society which is so different from ours. And China's been a big player in the world ever since the 1940s, but nothing like the last 20 years. This has really expanded everything. Mm. So... I think as much part of doing this is, is, I think you're saying you're working with NATO in some capacity on this. Do you want to just explain your role sure. you're working on? Well, like, like, like a lot of people who work in civil society, think tanks and, and research groups and the like, um, I'm involved um, with a group who are working to promote and protect democratic values. And I think the context of what's happening in NATO countries, North America and across Europe, is that um, we're dealing with fake news, disinformation, and some very toxic social media trolling. Um, it doesn't, it's no surprise that it happens 
to come from certain countries, which are not liberal democracies, they're not free countries, um, and also criminal groups and others who work uh, or are aligned to interests that are against um, our sort of types of democracies. So that's what I'm doing uh, in one area of work. But the story of China is global, bigger than anything that's happening in Europe or even across the Atlantic. Hmm. I've had this discussion with a few other guests that I've had. So I'm, I, I just turned the corner to hit 40. I know that you're a few years older than me. I, I remember <laughs> that's the, I remember the remnants of um, the USSR, but even fundamentally when it collapsed in, in 91, I would have only been 10. So it's not a, an area or, or a period that I remember very well for a lot of kids that are 20 or 25 or even younger. Now, the, it seems that the, the collective memory of the dangers of communism has been completely lost. And what I'm trying to move this into is, can you just take us for a second, kind of reminding us of what communism was like from World War II to 91 uh, and how China is kind of filling this void? Yeah, well, I, look, I think the easiest way to reference it is when you talk Cold War to anybody, they think of spy movies and they think of yes. America versus Russia trying to get people into space and stealing technology and um, running agents in different countries and trying to influence elections. Gee, that sounds just like what's happening now. Um, but of course, with much higher technology and a very much behind the scenes. Um, the big competition was America, capitalism, freedom, liberalism, um, with its own challenges, versus communism, the Soviet style of communism, control, one party, uh, supermarkets that were empty, people mostly getting on in life poorly, um, but everybody had a job, even though some people weren't very productive, and everything was sort of free, whether or not it was actually very effective. Um, and that clash of ideas, that clash of values, that you are it's a bit like Pepsi and Coke. Mm. Um, there is no middle ground. You were either for America or you were for Russia. And places in Africa, places uh, in South Asia, um, there was influence across Europe in Communist Party and far left groups that were funded by and supported by the Soviet Union. And like Solidarity in Poland, there were groups wanting freedom in the controlled societies that had friends in America, that had friends in Western Europe. So it was a big clash of ideas. Um, and what's happened is that China seems to be, and understandably, the big challenger to America in just a different way of looking at life. It's a different system. Mm. It's a top-down, one party. Everybody is on the team for China. There is so little freedom. There is so little ability to be a critic. Um, and Americans, American values are being pitted up against collectivist values that have some really ugly undertone. Uh, and one could say that the China of 50 years ago was the um, deputy to the Soviet Union. They were the big gunslinger and, you know, or they were the marshal, their side of things, and China came, ar came around for the, the ride. China seems to be now the big player and the new Russia seems to be floating around, keeping out of their way and sometimes collaborating. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it really is another big game between two very different sets of values. Uh, recently, it was announced as well that um, Ping is, has been ratified as the president for life, effectively, if that gives you um, an understanding of how different they're set up. What Fundamentally, what do you think that means? It's, it's authoritarian? I, I think the bottom line is... Um, it's it's a 
it's an affirmation of their system in one way because the accountability cycle just doesn't exist. We have very imperfect elections in democracies. You don't have to tell me that people were passionate about uh, Clinton versus Trump. People were passionate about Trudeau versus the conservative option. Everybody sees politics as a tough game. But in the end, one side wins, one side loses. In the communist Chinese system, it's one group at the very top, a very small number of people who pull all the strings and the deck is so marked in their favour. Becoming leader for life or president for life, it's effectively like being a new total dictator emperor. It's, it's not something that people didn't see, but people were still surprised that this happened because it's a change in the way China likes to present itself. Uh, it, remember, the party controls the armed forces. The party is the government rather than the other way around. If we have parties that can be in government and parties that are in opposition. There is no other side. There is no other perspective in the Chinese system. And what was it called? A, was it a couple of years ago where they have their sort of their Communist Party forum and they had set kind of the, the forward agenda and this this really, uh, when the West heard about it, 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 it put into context and it verbalized everything that, that they had been thinking for the last decade yeah. or so. Literally from around 2012, there's been a change in the language and you know, diplomats and commentators and academics. And, and let's be honest, you know, there are a thousand more qualified China experts floating around, but I'm looking at it from the perspective of somebody who's engaged in what we call Western democracy mm. and Western society. The China of the last 10 years is speaking about being a new way of thinking. It's harnessing the world's strongest and toughest um, uh, advances in technology with a regime that is ruthlessly efficient. It's like the old story. There are seven deadly sins. The one sin that the People's Republic of China and the Communist Party do not suffer from is sloth. There is no tardiness. There is no lack of dedication. If you want people who are excellent, hardworking, clever, and ruthlessly efficient in getting the job done, you could not ask for a more capable and disciplined crowd. The yeah. only problem is that it's produced re-education camps for over a million people. Mm -hmm. It's produced 30,000 plus people who have disappeared. It's produced artificial islands in the South China Sea, and it's and it's continued repression of places like Tibet um, and conflict in the in the high Himalayan mountains, I which is that, beyond the pale. That's what I was going to go with. It kind of the next spot of, of what do you think are sort of the top five to ten things that they're doing? Because as as you list them all, I think we've all heard of these and we're all aware of it. But when you when you when you stick them together, as sort of a and an, an encyclopedia Britannica of, of offences. Well, we don't have 10 hours. We barely have maybe an hour and a bit to canvas everything. But I'll go back to those seven deadly sins because the other six, there is evidence that every one of those six really negative values, which we know from, you know, not even Bible stories, just general culture in the West, Things like pride and greed and, and the raw for the anger or the envy or the lust for power, you know, or the gluttony of the overzealous extremism, um, the overreach. Every aspect of those negative values 
there's a clear cut contemporary today issue. A good example is the wolf warrior diplomats, the diplomats who go on Twitter, go give speeches, attack people um, verbally, have even physical presence. Um, you know, r realistically, they are the shock troops. They're not diplomats in the traditional sense. They are very much the shock troops of the regime. Mm. There's this pride. Um, you disagree with China, you're against China. There is no, we can disagree, but we still respect you, a narrative. They just won't come at that. Or the greed or that uncontrolled longing for power or material gain. And I'm thinking of Belt and Road, where you've got this neo-colonialist expansion of China, where you know China offers millions upon you know billions of dollars, effectively equivalent of finance, that their workers come and build things. Yes. They get the benefit, but they you finish up own like a uh, being indebted to the mafia, you owe them money. You owe them obligation. Um, you have to play ball. And it doesn't matter if they build a port in Sri Lanka or they do something in Pakistan or they're in more than well over a dozen countries across Africa. It's all about control and power. And in some ways, uh, you know, these values are toxic because it's bad for China and, and for the people of China, as well as the community of nations. I mean, I think the aggressiveness, the destructive emotion of the way the Communist Party operates, um, and I'm not saying that because it's only communism. We all know that there are political movements that are extreme. We know politicians as a class in Western countries can be some of the most uninspiring, underwhelming individuals. We all have examples of a poor leader or a person who maybe shouldn't be in politics. But when you have a regime that is so aggressive, so committed to stamping out any alternative viewpoint, and that's how they carry themselves um, in international relations, um, and I'm thinking of conflict with India over the high Himalayan mountains, um, conflict over Taiwan, flying in Taiwanese designated airspace because they don't recognise Taiwan as even a neighbouring country, let alone, you know, a sovereign nation. Um, you know, and it's this level um, I mean, I, I think, you know, the story of Jack Ma, classic example of what could be the envious Freud of literally watching somebody who was big, powerful, a billionaire, somebody of global status, and he's in jail. He's ruined financially. His family is under threat. It's sending a message. Is he? So I, I know that he disappeared and other celebrities, but I've not heard anything. I haven't explored the issue, but I've not heard anything more. As far as you know, he 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 has been jailed and he's he's disappeared well, off. If if he hasn't been jailed, it's the sort of coercive security arrangement that anybody in Wisconsin, anybody in Manitoba, anybody in Western Australia would say, this looks and smells like jail. Whether or not there's been a judicial system decision, the the idea that somebody so prominent is publicly walked into custody and disappears from sight in such a manner that should send a chill down the the backbone of anyone who's even vaguely prominent in Chinese society. I mean, you know, we know that there's this lust for power um, that China is playing for because it, if it's not a position on at Interpol, 
or it's not a position at the WHO, or if it's not changing a certain country's view about whether or not China, uh, Taiwan is, is, a, is, a, is, is a sovereign nation. Therefore, you know, let's try to bully, harass or intimidate or even just bribe people to change their views. You know, it's these sorts of characteristics that make China a big player in everyone's considerations. I am sure that, that the China of today is more effective, more of a threat than the Soviet Union of the 1980s for the simple reason they have so much of the best Western technology, much of it secured through, let's call it, unorthodox means. They have such an advanced society with technology, with infrastructure, and yet they've got weaknesses in their society. They've got a massive credit overhang. They've got empty cities that don't have enough investment now. And their one-child policy has created 30, 40, 45 million um, men who will never um, find a partner um, in life. And, you know, these are some major elements that create the the benchmark or the landscape for right. so aggression, for risk taking, and for really, really bad outcomes. No, Noel, what what I want to do is uh, I want to get into some specific examples here and talk yep. about because at the moment we're just kind of we're we're moving over here, yeah, then we're talking sure. about this, and we don't all over. For, yep. For, for people that are listening that don't have a context on this, again, we, we, we sure. want to actually understand what's going on. So um, why don't we look at security first? You, you had already mentioned that. Um, I think the, the, the term that they use for it is, is belt on road. Also within there, we've got the South China um, Sea Crisis and probably Huawei is one of the biggest things yeah. of technology in, in the West. Let's stick to those three first. You, you talked about Not the a problem. Um, belt on road. Just you talked about it briefly, but as I said, what sure. what my understanding is is that these are the um, uh, if if we use China in emerging economies, it's the same predatory lending scheme as paycheck lenders that we see here in the West, oh. where they go, we're going to bail you out of this, and then effectively, once you default, they absorb a portion of your of your land or, or collateral. That's my understanding, effectively, of what they're it's, doing. Can you, it's can you a very a good one, analogy. A 101 um, on this. Yeah, sure. It's a very good analogy. Think of countries that have young population, growing populations, incredible need for infrastructure, for investment. They don't have access to relatively easy money from Western banks. There's also the overhang of colonialism. And, you know, do you want to go back and ask people from Europe and North America for funding? China turns up. They offer a miracle. Plenty of money, a commitment to get projects done. It may be a project like a bridge in Macedonia. It may be a port in Sri Lanka. It may be factories in East Africa. Um, it could be some sort of technology plant, um, energy plant in Pakistan. China underwrites it, often much of the raw materials and also the critical skilled labour comes from China. So you've got Chinese workers literally with their own security details and their own paychecks going back to China doing the work Think of guest workers in their thousands. Um, and then at the end of the day, the country that did the deal gets an infrastructure, but they find that they can't make it pay or they find that the, the environment, the marketplace, the prices have shifted. All of a sudden, you look at the contracts, China says, we own this and we own also the land Round. And also, there are questions of whether or not China has extraterritorial rights. In other words, can China say this is now Chinese territory mm. in the middle of the Balkans, in the middle of East Africa, in the middle of the Indian Ocean? Um, 
it's a really scary thought that desperate countries, often full of low-income young populations, are sucked into, are caught up in a um, loan shark mafioso style. It's a great deal that if you don't pay us back, we sort of break your legs type of situation. You know, it is it is ugly. It has shades of colonialism about it. The 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 news stories about um, uh, indi you know individuals um, who treat their indigenous workers from the local country, be it from in East Africa or South Asia. Very, very effectively, the, what we're trying to say and what they're doing with this is, is that they're almost going head to head with the US. They're setting this up in a lot of ways to create military bases as well around the world. They're, they're oh, effectively it's, going head to head. It's military, US, it? it's strategic, it's economic, it's political influence, but it is also operations. If it's a base in Djibouti, if it's a base in Sri Lanka, it's the old story. The Chinese have built a navy, which is a blue water navy. It's no longer a coastal navy. The Chinese are very good at saying they have an interest across the globe. It's no longer just East Asia or Southeast Asia. And, you know, this was no surprise. If you, you know, if you think of China as like an adolescent, it's like giving your adolescent your gun collection. Your, your beer collection, the keys to your pickup, and also a roadmap to every uh, tavern and speakeasy in a three in a three state um, sort of location. And it's a Saturday night, and off they go. You know what could go wrong? Uh, I you know Belt and Road has been happening for well over ten years. It started off looking like a sort of aid program, it's really become an obligation program. Mm. And, 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 and it is very much, you're absolutely right, it is very much targeting the world that is not the West and America, it's targeting the rest of the world. And it's undermining the relationship between countries in Asia, Africa, South America, places like the Balkans with the United States with the West, and that's part of that big geopolitics. All right. Let, let's move on from there then, because we want to be able to cut sure. these into listenable clips for people. Sure. So if, now if we look at keeping with security and Huawei, so um, I know in Canada, I believe there was discussion that they've effectively said Huawei is not allowed to tender on any sort of government style work. I believe there's a, a similar arrangement in Australia. That's I believe great. this has to do with the fact that these uh, Huawei is proposed to be an independent company, but is actually owned by China. And it seems to have been determined that their devices are secretly listening in and part of their scheme is to be able to get into deep into area of like things like government telecommunications to be able to um, spy on, on the rest of the world. Do I broadly speaking, do I have that correct? And, and what does that mean? Okay. Uh, the, the easy answer is, even if you're not absolutely correct in the fine detail, the big picture is that all Chinese-based global corporations are under the national security laws of China, which have been beefed up to, in a very simple sense, say, put the interests of China, the nation, and China, the nation, is referenced to the party first and foremost. So therefore, you've got very significant um, reach in terms of privacy, in terms of people's information, in terms of people's big data. And companies like Huawei and others, you know, can be seen to be not truly independent of the Chinese government, but also it's the simple question, do you want your critical infrastructure in terms of um, digital 
communications. And everyone survives on their phone, their tablet, their laptop. Nothing is outside the reach now of the Internet of Things. Do you want the platform to be based, run, and accountable to a regime that has very different values from your society? Uh, we're not talking about a German company, a British company, an American company. We're talking about a company that has global reach but does represent the values um, um, and also the blind spots of the, the regime that we're talking about. Um, do many we have countries any, have any evidence for this? Like, because I remember there is, broadly there is, reading in there the is paper. A mix, yeah, there is a mix of technical evidence that um, the controls and the protections are weaker when um, certain companies are involved, but it's also the very basic principle. Um, do you really want, in a geopolitical sense, when China is the big competitor economically and politically with all Western countries, do you really want your critical infrastructure like telecommunications, like all the digital platforms that we exist on and rely upon, uh, to be um, susceptible? And it's safer rather than sorry. Australia and Canada have been very, very strong. Britain has moved much closer to that position. The United States has taken a stand, but there's other countries that are deeply concerned about this because we've seen with the two Michaels, when we had that situation, two Canadian citizens in jail in China on, on what could only be argued to be trumped up terribly um, weak cases um, of, of significant criminal behaviour. Um, they seem to be pawns in some ransom game between Canada and China. And then an executive from this, this, this very well-known company um, gets to go back home to China and mysteriously the two Michaels are released. Fabulous for them, wonderful for their families, but such a lesson about how the interest of the state and the party is so aligned to the interest of big Chinese business. Mm. Um, it's too much of a coincidence. All right. And then what are we looking at with the South China Sea at the moment? This, from what I'm looking at, oh. this seems to be the instance or, or the issue that would potentially send us to war. It's the flashpoint. Um, we saw in the First World War, it was the Balkans. It was this mix of passion, uh, a degree of stupidity and a lot of arrogance and people thinking, I can't back down. South China Sea is big overreach, a big, greedy, gluttonous push by China to grab resources to the detriment of places like Vietnam, of Thailand, of the Philippines, of Japan, of course, of Taiwan. It's militarizing the sea lanes that takes a significant amount of world sea trade. Remember, most products do not travel for our advanced societies. Most products don't come across land, they come by sea. And so much. You know, let's be honest, China is the factory in the same way as Britain was the factory of the 1800s. And in the late 1800s, it was Britain and Germany and America that were the great factories of the world. China has positioned itself with its trade policy, with its control of its um, uh, cost of production, with a very compliant labor force. You don't see Chinese workers striking because they don't have free trade unions. You know, that's that's an inconvenience in the, to, to the Marxist ideology. You've got so much trade going through the South China Sea. And China has created artificial islands 
and has claimed the undersea resources and the control and the airspace. And that's why the Royal Navy with its carrier group, that's why the US Navy, that's why Australia, Japan, India, a whole host, France, Germany, are doing navigation exercises because they're saying this is international waters. And China is saying, no, it's not. It's our domestic space. And it's an area that is, as they say, many times the size of Texas. It's an enormous part of the world, which is rich in fishing, in oil, but also in access. Um, and it's a very, it's like somebody coming down your driveway and pitching a tent in your front garden and saying, this is my land. And they live across the road from you, but they're claiming a bit of your front yard. How is this generally, do you know much about how this is supposed to be arbitrated? It's, it's international waters, effectively, and they're yeah. kind of claiming that. So uh, people like the Philippines have been to the, the relevant international maritime courts. Um, many of these jurisdictions are based in the Netherlands, the classic Hey, you name it, there's, there's lawyers, um, you know, to do international work. But China, you know, it's a bit like the bully at school. Um, the, they're saying we don't accept the international rule of law. We disagree with the determination. It's no surprise. They're big enough. They're powerful enough. What's the Philippines going to do? Um, if fishing boats are caught, they get rammed or they get pushed off or they get seized. Right. You know, uh, we're talking very aggressive activity by a country that feels that it's owed a greater share of the cake. Um, and, and that has led to an over um, aggressiveness. It's caused, a, I think, a mistake. For Chinese policy, because they've, you know, they've made people who weren't even super, super friendly with the United States much closer to the United States. Uh, the irony of Vietnam saying America should consider maybe a naval base in northern Vietnam. To many veterans of the Vietnam War, that is an astounding example of how the Teutonic plates of politics have changed. Mm. Um, you know, and you've got, look at the bipartisanship in Australia. There is oh, a even very the Liberal sense. and Labour Party for the first time, it seems that, that yeah. the Labour Party is, is fundamentally in agreement with the Liberal that we, we are under threat at the moment. Well, the Labour Party has had its dramas and the Liberals with Chinese influence and grubby lobbying and people have fallen by the wayside and rightfully so but you've got labor and liberal in the same way as you've got conservative and liberal in canada who are taking these national security issues very very much to heart and they see this as the national interest mm. um 300 american marines in darwin are a drop in the bucket mm. that having a British nuclear submarine pop up and say hello in Western Australia and having a carrier group from Britain turn up in the South China Sea and go all the way to Japan and show the flag like the Royal Navy used to do in the old days, that was a very big step. It's a lot of the democracies are getting together in the same way as democracies had to join up in the 1930s mm. against totalitarianism. So I know it's uh, a very old analogy, but it, some days it feels like 1938. I don't disagree with you. I think I'm more astounded that, um, you know, just talking to people every day, 
uh, it seems very, very hard for most people to grasp the concept of geopolitics. And, and I'm not saying this against anyone, but I mean, when it, very few people that I talk to seem to understand that there are forces beyond our means happening when they just think the only issue that we really have to worry about is how they dislike their local politician or why, you know, a traffic light needs to be fixed. Look, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't blame people who don't know or don't remember the Cold War because the Cold War, things moved much slower. Mm. Media was much more controlled, both in free societies and, of course, in communist societies. You didn't have so much information at your fingertips. You didn't have the technology. You also didn't have all the white noise, all the background noise. Yeah. I go to a hotel now in Britain. I have a choice of 140 TV well, channels. Not only absolutely, that. Absolutely, 120 are absolute rubbish. I totally get that. But I actually can watch Russia Today news. I can watch Chinese news in the English language, and it's putting out their view. Mm. We've let that happen. It's not like you can see the BBC in every hotel in China. There is a lot more control in their yeah. society. And if you were running a one-party state, you would do that. You would not want your population. That's very, very interesting. I've never once access. thought about the fact that I can watch Russia today in virtually every country that I go into. I've never actually thought about that before. Well, I just think it's, it's, it's incredibly interesting that some of the most passionate, conservative and passionate, what you would call liberal in America or left wing in, say, Europe, people are getting access to getting their ideas out on a channel that is very much the arm of a very toxic state to, that to has very our society. strong values, yeah. which are in no way consistent with traditional conservatism or traditional social democracy or socialism um, in the Western sense. And I think that's, that's really quite a reminder of democracies are not so much weak but the, the perimeter wall around democracies is low. Mm. You cannot get information into North Korea. You cannot get information into China to reach the average person that easily. You can get a very bad idea, toxic idea, vaccines are bad, GPs don't know what they're talking about, all politicians are corrupt, stupid, the system is against you, the, the the elite don't care, you name it, anything that can undermine what keeps people and democracies together can be run because we're a freer society and there are there is less censorship and there is less effective control. Um, and it didn't matter when it was impossible unless you listen to the radio from Moscow or the, or Beijing, in the old days, Peking. Um, now, it's on your phone, it's on your tablet, it's, a, it's on your TikTok, it's on your Instagram. I mean, today's teenager probably gets more bad information in one day than I got in one year. Yeah. When the world was newspapers, radio, uh, television. It seems so simple and yet so controlled. All right. Um, I want to keep us on track because, again, the, sure. we're going to want to. Uh, I, feel, I feel like we're kind of going going everywhere at the moment. I no, really want to cut through in, into, into things. So we were trying to talk about security issues and we finished off with the South China Sea. So that was that's supposed to be international waters and they're effectively moving in. Two things here. I want to I want to stay on these. Hong Kong. And Taiwan. Okay. So even for, a, a, again, without assuming people's knowledge, Hong Kong is part of China. It's not part of what we would consider mainland China up until 1999. Uh, it was part of the British Empire, at which point it was handed over, I think, after 100 years war. We're now seeing um, the thumb of communism drop down, which is what we're hearing about those democratic protests in Hong Kong. At the same time, China's infiltrating the South China Seas, and they're now um, reminding 
in their opinion, rather Taiwan, that they are not an independent country, that they are owned by China. Let's just talk about those two things exclusively. Sure. What's happening Absolutely. in Pretty Hong cool. Kong and why why is this news now? This seems to have only come up in the last couple of years with, with Taiwan and the argument of independence. Sure. It's, it's really simple about Hong Kong. It's because China feels it doesn't have to keep to the deal it made with Britain. Okay. It was a convenience. The two system, one country fallacy was um, Hong Kong will be part of China, but it will have its own special conditions, its own legal system. Uh, people will be able to be, you know, free to, to, to a greater extent, there'll be capitalism, people will be able to make money and get rich. Um, there'll be their own passport system. It will be the window to the world. China doesn't need that window anymore, but China is also sending a very strong message. When the ordinary people, especially the young people, the yellow umbrellas, the young people who were you know, demonstrators, activists, we're talking about people who were not necessarily radical in any traditional sense. They just wanted freedom and they wanted it now. Um, China just closed down the parliament in terms of changing the rules. You had to be pre-selected. You had to be approved to stand for parliament. You had a new security law, which meant if you said, Hong Kong should have more freedom or should have the different system to the mainland, all of a sudden, you could go to jail. So you we continue to charged. have free elections, but the people putting up yeah, yeah, had the, to all be free the approved. For granted. Yeah. Judges who aren't members of the party, um, lawyers who will you know, seek to protect your rights, a civil service that's not corrupt and is efficient, um, a system where there is private property and there is money making and there's there's that that veneer of western life mm. that's all now gone um hundreds of thousands of people are leaving hong kong some people left at the very beginning after the handover others stayed hoping to believe in the two system one country deal that deal's now being junked just been thrown away and where do you think we are with that camp. now? Is it within uh, a period I think, of two I think years? Hong Kong is, look, I think Hong Kong in two years' time will look worse than Shanghai. It will look like a regional city in China with disappearances, with no press freedom, with one-party rule, and it will be a sullen, unhappy place that will look back and go, we used to be the capitalist tiger in East Asia, and now we're no longer that important. Mm. This has all come out because there's a big message to Taiwan. Look at what we did. If we could do this to Hong Kong, and it's full of very wealthy people, and it's full of lots of strategic economic assets, that says that mainland China is prepared to fight the long game and get its own way in Taiwan. Perfect. And, and this, that's, this that's really ugly. That. So um, they're, they're demonstrating that they're, they're going to push out any form of, of liberal democracy left in Hong Kong. And they're you're saying they're using this as effectively as a media example to Taiwan to say, you're um, next. So let's, yeah. what, what I want to yeah, understand. It's, it's, it's like saying, I've beaten up the kid correct. around the corner. I'm coming for you. All right. So what is what do you think that fundamentally means? Where where are we at with this? Taiwan, as far as the 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 Western world is concerned, is an independent nation. Countries that are lining up with China are are siding with them and saying that they are a protectorate or subservient or satellite state of China. What do, what happens next? Where are we going with this? Okay. What happens next is the the West has got to ask itself the question, is the deal in the 1970s when the People's Republic of China, the communist regime run out of Beijing, convinced the world that there is a one China policy? That's how they got themselves the seat 
at the United Nations in the Security Council, one of the five permanents, uh, Red China said there is one China only, and they parked the issue of Taiwan in the corner. Now, Taiwan, that produces about 20% of the world's semiconductors, and absolutely critical. It's a bit like with Saudi Arabia and oil, it's with high tech. Mm. Taiwan is a liberal, pluralistic, free, LGBT friendly, you name it. It's a classic showcase democracy. It's not perfect by any means, but it's a country full of hardworking, well-educated, freedom. It is a people. beacon of freedom as far as we're concerned. It is, but the it majority, is The majority 50 years ago said, oh, we sort of feel quite Chinese. The clear majority of people who live in Taiwan now, the absolute clear majority say, we are Taiwanese, we are independent. Okay. They have lived there for several generations, even if they escaped from the Civil War in the 1940s to get to Taiwan. A lot of people have lived there for hundreds of years in Taiwan. Um, it's a society that has its own sense of freedom, its own sense of identity. And Western countries got to grapple with the idea that they can't just have an economic office or a business office and recognise it as a trading player, they've got to say one China policy is now no longer valid. They've got to look at Taiwan and say it smells like a democracy, it feels like a democracy, it has all the hallmarks of a democracy. We're a democracy, we will recognise it as a sovereign country. So again, That's a very critical red line that has to be stepped over. So um, what do you think is going to happen with this is what I'm asking. Where, where are we, where, well, where do we go from here? Where, where do you think they're going okay. to do? Okay. If the West goes down this road, there is a real chance that China will overreact. But will the hard heads of the People's Liberation Army be able to stop any super aggressive overreaction? You've got the possibility of a boycott or a maritime um, exercise to try to blockade Taiwan. You've got investment, economic power by China. And there's always the possibility China could damage Taiwan militarily sufficiently to make it look like they could invade and get a toehold. Mm. But the reality is, Taiwan has a strong military, a strong sense of um, national independence, and it has a political leadership that do not want to be subjugated by Beijing. It's getting ugly, but Western countries have got to side on the, you know, with the, with the um, people that share their values. Because what does it say if we just let Taiwan go? It is a very big um, failure of Western interests. Because then what happens to China saying to Vietnam, we fought a border war with you after the Vietnam War. We want some territory. No one's going to protect you. America's not going to do anything. Let's, let's take a slice of your country. What's Vietnam going to do? So, you know, the, the chips are really down now. Um, I think the next couple of years, we will see as close to a war-like environment where miscalculations and really, you know, risky behaviour is going to be seen as quite natural and normal, okay. which is not good. It's right. not good for the economy, not good for society. Uh, I want to move on because we're quickly running out of time. Sure. And, yeah, totally um, get that. Uh, and, and I want to just, as much as COVID has been done to death, again, I, I'm, you know, and, and frankly, I'm tired of everyone's opinion on it, whether you're pro-vax, yeah. anti-vax, or anything. I'm, I'm, I don't want to get into any of that stuff at all. What I'm trying to understand a little bit more is China's involvement in COVID. And again, as you've already identified, 
I consider myself relatively centrist, but it's impossible to try to gather information through media outlets when it's driven by one narrative or the other. So firstly, the narrative that came out said that COVID is some form of flu that came out of China's wet markets. At the time, Trump was saying, I don't believe it. This is lab grown by China. It's them damn Chinese that have done this. And everyone said, we hate you, Trump. We dislike you. We're not going to believe you anything. Now that he's out of office, there seems to be, we've moved on from that. This became now Fauci and everything. But behind the scenes and underneath that, there seems to, at least the implication that I've read, that this is part of, uh, what is it, gain, uh, gain of form research that the U.S., was actually a partner and invested in. Before we talk about anything else, do you know anything about the situation and, and okay. you know, the origins okay. of this? Um, there are millions of people who think they know more than what's publicly available. But the bottom line has to be that it's occurred in a city with China's top biological warfare laboratory. Okay. It's happened in the equivalent of what you would call China's Cambridge or Oxford in terms of high quality, top class, scientific um, skill. It happened in a society that flows down Wuhan very, very quickly, but let thousands of people travel in particular, not to the rest of China, but to places like Northern Italy. So you've got this really weird situation whereby the pandemic seems to point to a very much a, a great mishap in China of whatever origin, but there has been this totalitarian clampdown we saw with the doctor who got sick and was silenced and it, and and, and I apologize for not remembering his name because his image is etched in my memory it's the classic whistleblower there is something going wrong mm -hmm. and we've seen the naked politics play with this um, there are no winners if, if, if this was a lab mistake or a lab grown issue or a disposable disposal of an animal that was done improperly or even some petty corruption, um, you know, it's more of a mishap than a calculated strategy. Okay. For the simple reason that the calculated strategy has been poorly executed. It, it doesn't have biological warfare written over it. It has biological hazard uh, and mishap written over it. So if I'm... Fact, if I'm... It would be used as a biological weapon is something which is down the track in another universe of technology. Um, oh. The world has faced this terrible pandemic um, which has caused untold misery, but has also destabilized our societies, including China's. Now, if I'm following your train of thought then, or, or I'm being assumptive here, though, what we're effectively saying is it's come out of one of the cities where they partake in this sort of uh, research. Yep. Possibly then, this hasn't been fully weaponized. We're still playing around with this, and it somehow escaped the lab. This sounds like a much more logical idea than it was cut from a bad in a wet market. Even if there's not enough evidence in front of us, there's enough um, opportunity to explore. And it's like the WHO medical panel, scientific panel, uh, who went there and were given very limited access mm. and had many of their initiatives frustrated or curtailed. You, you need the scientists and the medical people 
and the planners need to know how this happened for the simple reason that we're all in the same boat. But it's the pride, it's the arrogance, and it's the totalitarian, we shut down debate mentality, mm. which makes it harder. It's a bit like Chernobyl. Did we think in the earlier era that, oh, the Russians run their nuclear power plants really badly? Not really. We thought Russia, full of really clever scientists and engineers, they put somebody in space before the Americans, um, you know, they can build missiles, they'll run a nuclear power plant really well. The fact that they had the great meltdown and the disaster wasn't the problem. The fact that they lied and covered up about the problem, that was the criminality and the problem for okay. its neighbours. So It meant millions of animals were killed in Eastern Europe and Northern Europe, and all of a sudden we had people you know, across Russia, across Ukraine, suffering cancers, you know, a tragedy all around. And, and so remind me again, what, what is the relationship with who and China? Because I, I remember again, distinctly, I think it was Trump came out and said something and this, this funding or the cleanup or something was quietly and secretly sponsored by China. And that's why they hadn't actually taken a strong position uh, on this? Look, um, I think there's a lot of commentators who have said that the WHO have been less open, less direct, and less dependable. And of course, if China is paying a significant part of the bill and has significant leverage over who are not just the, who is not just the top person, but the whole let's call it class of senior executives, if China has a big voice in the WHO, people will feel uncomfortable. And I get that. But the, this was a classic example of where a country could have said, we think there's been a terrible disaster. There has been maybe questions of negligence. There's been questions of... of of criminality, there's been questions of, of poor procedure. Coming clean would have strengthened China's hand in this. Because mm. in the end, no amount of propaganda or narrative is ever going to say it came com comprehensively and definitively from shellfish from New Zealand or kiwi fruit from Australia or some product from California. You can't run that argument and not find yourself, you know, in very shallow water. The, um, the, the big agency globally for health needs to put health first. And it's not a criticism. It's totally understandable that they would be sensitive, but they need to work around the problem. And this is a non-medical person saying as one of the billions affected by the pandemic, um, you know, people expect more. It's mm -hmm. like the United Nations uh, refugee um, efforts or UNICEF. Organisations exist for a mission. The WHO has a very clear mission. And I think it's failed a lot of its stakeholders. But... It has, it has a chance to fix things up. Mm. Uh, not only that, like I remember going back, they were saying there was the outbreak in Wuhan. I remember watching the news about eight weeks later saying they've cleared all the COVID cases in Wuhan. And yet we've been locked down for a year here and all of a sudden we've got mysterious cases popping up out of the blue in all these places. Like it just, it doesn't seem to have been enough pressure or um, questioning of this narrative that's happening. In addition to that, I, I believe China was the first one to, uh, put forward a, a vaccine. I think even Canada was close to buying this or taking this up without considering the fact that it had been released by them and now they were going back into their pockets. To, like there's, um, This is what I'm getting at. There, there doesn't seem to be enough conversation of much of how this seems to have been created by China, mandated, monitored, and solved by China. They've created this sort of feedback loop that, that nobody seems to be saying, hey, there seems to be a problem here. 
Look, I think, I think Jesse, that you're absolutely right to raise those questions. The, it's always not, it's not about the Chinese people. It's not just about Chinese society or economy or, or the elements of civil society. You know, well over a billion Chinese citizens just are living the best life they can for their kids, for their grandparents, um, for themselves. They just want to get along. The everyday person has been impacted by this pandemic, restrictions, economic job loss, um, the death of loved ones, illness. You know, you know, some people say, I can't travel. That's a very small cost versus all the other costs mm. that, are ha- that have happened. And it's been a crushing blow, especially for many young people. Um, but it's the system, you know, and I think owning up, it's a bit like when Russia owned up to the Katyn massacre in the 1940s. Mm. It came 50 years after 25,000 or so Polish officers were shot in the back of the head by the Russian secret police and buried secretly and blamed it on the Germans. You know, that complete fallacy took 50 years for Russia to say, okay, the paperwork is out, um, we did it. I'm but sure of course, we could have no one, an entirely no different one was alive on or no one was, was, was uh, prosecuted for that hideous um, human rights crime and violation. Um, I think we expect more now. We're all interconnected. Um, we don't want to see the world with big barriers and big walls if we can help it. And free societies have got confidence. You know, the, the young Chinese people who come to universities overwhelmingly are no different to our young people. A small number are political operatives, you know, you know, very hardcore. We believe in the ideology. They want to pick up some skills and they want to spy on their uh, maybe on their fellow students. But the reality is most people just um, want to get qualifications to be able to lead a good life. And it's that recognition about the commonality of, of interest that's been held up by the arrogance and the pig-headedness of regimes that there is no accountability. Mm. Um, you know, and I think that's where we've got, we've got ourselves into this problem. You, having a superpower competing with America is not the problem. Having a superpower that is tone deaf to the views and values of others, its neighbours and its trading partners, you know, bullying Australia because it asked for an inquiry into the Wuhan situation, bullying New Zealand, you know, treating Canada so uh, shabbily, threatening places like Germany and France with trade issues if they don't toe the line, that's, that's not a mature superpower. That's a weak superpower that's, that's, that's unsure. And I, you know, one of the best stories I've seen in the last few years was the, a, an interesting narrative about the leader of China hasn't been overseas for how many months? Is he scared mm. that if he's away, something's going to happen? Someone else is going to take over the shop. Now, that's a fascinating story for a spy novel or a, or a Jason Bourne type film. Mm. But the reality is weakness because of arrogance and fragility of system, you know, can sometimes create the conditions for really poor decisions. Um, China is acting um, not in its best interest and also not in the interest of the Chinese people, but that's not just me saying it. There's plenty of commentators who just marvel at the wrong decisions or the poor decisions coming out of Beijing because they have not made any friends and they are losing friends, or at least they're losing people who might be neutral to their position. Um, you know, I, I, I know we've canvassed a lot and I'm sorry if we didn't get to all your questions, but um, this story about China 
is the story of the next 20 years. Um, um, in the same way as America grew to be the big power in the world, China has the ability and the capacity to be one of the two big dogs in the, in the yard. But it has to be careful it doesn't overreach. Because if it loses um, a battle um, now, it could get wounded very, very severely. And um, conflict is in no one's interest at all. Fair enough. I think that might be a good place to, to finish off at for today. Um, sure. So again, just and thank you for the opportunity of having the conversation. No, of course, you're more than welcome. So again, just, just remind people for uh, who might still be listening again, the, the work that you're doing right now and, and your involvement. In sure. The- um, in- if you go on to the National Liberal Club, um, YouTube, um, you can uh, channel, you can find some interesting talks by people talking about how spies think. That was a popular one uh, from somebody who used to work at GCHQ and was National Security Advisor, Sir David Omond. Uh, We've had talks from people from the Royal Navy, from the Royal Air Force. We've had talks on cultural change and we've had talks uh, on things like hybrid warfare. Um, The very fact that what I'm doing is working on issues like fake news and disinformation. Um, It's amazing how everybody is so connected and that is part of the vulnerability um, of today's world. Um, And from London uh, to Canada, to Australia, to America, right across Europe, Western values are worth defending, but to defend them, you've got to understand. And it's some of the best champions of Western values are found in some of our most unusual places. Um, So there are some great critics, great um, opponents of of totalitarian regimes in civil society, progressive organisations, in education, people who are standing up for human rights in the same way as people in the defence and security space are standing up for our values. So it's a very much a big tent that um, is being mobilised at the moment. Hopefully um, our conversation can be part of that. Indeed. Well, I'm, I'm sure I'll be speaking to you again very shortly outside right. of this anyway. And, uh, but, uh, and congratulations on um, the podcast. Oh, thank you. Um, they, are, you. they are meaty and meaningful. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right. Until we speak again, Noel, thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. All the best.